The, the format of uh, tonight's lecture is going to be, uh, we have two speakers. Um, I had tried to set it up as a kind of debate uh, with a, a, a kind of a, a pro camp and, a, and an anti camp, uh, but both of our speakers were far too sensible uh, to agree to, uh, to to put up a kind of a straw man, uh, and I had to, 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 to wrestle quite hard to get them to disagree with each other at all. Uh, but I think they, they're going to sort of play ball a bit, uh, and, and hopefully we'll get uh, the, the different sides of, of uh, the debate. Um, and each of our speakers will speak for uh, about 25 minutes and then we'll have uh, the remainder of the time until half past six uh, for questions and points uh, from you, the audience. So, uh, our two speakers, uh, we have uh, two, two speakers who have, I guess, uh, sort of a foot in both camps, if you like, of the, the academic world and the real world. Um, so uh, what they have to say, I think, it should be uh, well grounded uh, in, in reality and, and, and not simply the ivory tower. Um, Leon Feinstein, who will be speaking second, or in, in reverse order, is head of, the, uh, of evidence at the uh, new Early uh, Intervention Foundation, which is one of the government's uh, government's new What Works centres. Um, he's also a visiting professor at the uh, Centre for the Analysis of Social Exclusion at the LSE. Uh, he was previously chief analyst uh, in the implementation unit at the Cabinet Office, uh, and before that he was uh, in the Prime Minister's delivery unit in the Treasury, and even further back he was a professor at the Institute of Education, um, and so uh, professor of social policy at the Institute of Education. Uh, Jeremy Hardy um, is currently a research associate at the Centre for Philosophy of Natural Sciences at Natural and Social Sciences at LSE, um, and he is uh, a, a co-author with Nancy Cartwright of uh, Evidence-Based Policy, A Practical Guide to Doing It Better. Um, Jeremy also has a long and distinguished business career, uh, having previously been uh, chairman of uh, WH Smith, uh, and prior to that, uh, a fellow and tutor in economics at Keeble College uh, in Oxford. Uh, so with no further ado, I will hand over to uh, Jeremy, and we have the interesting innovation this evening of no PowerPoint slides at all from either speaker. Jeremy. Thank you very much. I'm meant to be the person who's against them, and I hope I shall do something to live up to that description. Though, as, as Patrick was suggesting, it's not really my natural habitat. It's rather, it's rather more complicated than that, though I think there are questions which are about not only what can RCTs bring to social policy evaluation, but more broadly in that context, what are RCTs for, really? It's exaggerating it, but it's, it's fairly true that over the last 10 or 15 years, through initially the Cochrane and then the Campbell collaborations, a lot of work has been done on doing RCTs and similar. That's to say that warehouses have been set up, and in the warehouses you can find lots of evidence that this worked, or this works, or this will work. Distinctions which I shall labour a bit later. And I don't say that all that work has been done. I don't say that all RCTs are wonderful, I, I'm technically wonderful. Nor do I say that RCTs have been done on everything that, they, that RCTs should be done on. But I want to address this now, not so much the question of what have we got in the warehouses, but what is the stuff that's in the warehouses for? There is an answer to this question, though I'm not sure how far it really takes you, which is that if you go to the hierarchies of evidence, and the, the, the famous, most famous one is the Maryland hierarchy, what you see is that good evidence is RCT-type stuff at the top, and at the bottom there's a terrible thing called expert judgment or professional experience or something of that kind, which is no good at all for establishing the truth of the efficacy of a particular intervention. So one answer to the question, what, what are these warehouses full of, is they're full of good Good evidence, and by good evidence I mean the stuff that Maryland says is good evidence. Still, that leaves something to be said, I think, about what you do do with this bit of paper or box or kit that you go to the warehouse and get out because it's good evidence. And I think you have to start, and this may sound a little bit um, parsimonious in the sense of both mean-minded and narrow, you have to start, I think, with being a bit, uh, I have to start by being clear what that what RCTs can contribute depends on what RCTs actually do. It's said that they show what works. And I think that on any reasonable view of the phrase what works, there is a big gap between what RCTs establish and the establishment of the proposition that this intervention works. You need several intermediate steps. 
What RCTs do do, and they do it quite brilliantly, I mean, whoever, whoever thought it up, or whoever thought up, who, or Mill, whoever started all this, was brilliant to see that the method of differences is a way of getting at whether or not this intervention really caused, to prove whether or not this intervention really caused that outcome there in that population, and to show, therefore, that that intervention played a positive causal role there. Now, that can, can, for shorthand, quite properly be called it worked. You do the RCT, you have the properly controlled populations, and what you sh show is that this intervention caused that there. And that is a rock-solid conclusion. It's a rock-solid conclusion, but it, you must notice the tenses. It says that it worked in that population there at that time. The tense it does matter, the sentences in the past, it worked, it doesn't show that it will work here, nor more ambitiously, this is after all the most common phrase, that it works, meaning I suppose that it works generally, that you can use it almost everywhere without any substantial danger of it not working, I suppose. So, it follows, I think, that if what RCT showed that it worked there, then, in that population, I won't keep on saying there, then, in that population, uh, but that's what I'm saying under my breath all the time, um, you are, if you're evaluating, which is looking, looking backwards, on safe ground. If, for example, and maybe these days you are, you're paying me by results, and I come along to you, maybe as a commercial organisation, and I say that I will, if you buy this intervention off me, and you apply it to this population, then we will be able to see afterwards whether it's worked, and we'll be able to see that because the whole thing will be set up in such a way that it's RCT'd. Sure enough, at the end, if the RCT shows that it did work, I ought to be paid. And if it's payment by results, that use of RCTs is perfectly legitimate because what it does is show what you need in order to know whether or not to pay me by results. But I think Patrick used the hinted at a difference between evaluating, and I'm going to call that evaluating, okay? Evaluation, unfortunately, means lots of things. I'm going to call looking at whether this intervention worked here, evaluating. There's also the question of um, directing, directing policy, looking forward. And I think it's common ground, clear, that if you're going to do policy analysis, that is, trying to decide what policy is going to work, what intervention works, will work generally, you have to have two things. What is, one is what is nowadays typically called a logic model. You have to understand what mechanisms explain the behavior of the world or the bit of the world where you're intervening. And once you've got that model, then you have to have estimation. That you, that's to say, you have to have estimates of the model's parameters in your particular context. So you need to know how this bit of the world works, and you need to know, in particular, how your intervention is meant to work, and you have to understand enough about your context, where you are, to know whether the values of the variables or the state of the world in which you are, which you're in, is one which is going to work with this intervention to get the result you want. Now, I think it's plain that RCT and R an RCT, one RCT, um, gives you neither of these. It's, after all, the magic of the RCT procedure is it is black box, it's black box meaning you don't have to think about the confounding factors, you don't have to worry about what, what matters and what doesn't matter, because that it all, as it were, comes out in the wash, and that is the impeccable truth about the, uh, the proof-like nature of RCTs. And an RCT doesn't, give you any, doesn't tell you anything about the logic model. Of course, you will, unless you're mad, before you introduce an intervention, have a story in your head, a model, if you like, about how it's meant to work. But the RCT doesn't tell you anything about whether it does work like that, whether it worked like that here. All it tells you is that it worked. And, of, and it follows, of course, that it doesn't give you anything about uh, the estimation of the model's parameters in your particular context, what it was in detail, quantitatively, if you could get it, about the factors in your particular context that produce this result. And of course, I'm not talking about effect size. That's a completely different thing. That's an outcome thing, not a black box, not within the box thing. It doesn't tell you, to put it succinctly, why the intervention worked. A fortiori does not give you estimates of the values of the model's parameters in your context. Now, this matters 
And the, the most obvious reason why it must matter, it's obvious that it matters, is that we all know, don't we, that the history of replication is often extremely disappointing. There is a story, there is nearly a book, there is somewhere a website, there's something I've read, which is to the effect that it's, it, it, it's, it's wonderful how often pilots work. The counter to that is it's very depressing how often replication doesn't work. And there are many um, examples of this, and one example taken from med medicine is, is endarterectomy, which is a procedure for um, removing plaque from the inside of the carotid artery, is, is an example of failure of rollout. That's to say that it had a very high success rate under an RCT, and then mortality rates were 79% higher in the field than in the RCT context. Now, I think everybody of any experience in policy or any other field knows how things don't work when you, when you generalize them, when you put them out there into a wide variety of contexts. Now, I think that's common ground. Nevertheless, nevertheless, we do feel sometimes, don't we, that if you do an RCT, what you get is a result that really makes you feel that you could do this everywhere. And um, look at a favorable case. If you look at the, is it nudge, uh, nudge unit, uh, number 10 Downing Street anyway, test, learn, adapt, the example there is given of the court service. The court service has, a, has an unsurprising problem, and that is that people are, are not, um, not quick to pay their court fines. Somebody had the idea that if you sent people texts, as opposed to, I suppose, letters, or just hoping they would, um, if you sent texts to people to get them to pay their court of fines, what, you, might, you might get a better result. So they did an RCT. What they did was they sent some people texts, some people not texts, and the result was that more people paid their, paid their fines. Now, when you get that sort of result, you sort of feel there's nothing wrong with saying that shows that texting works, and works in my sense, that it's going to work pretty generally. And I think that's okay. I mean, I'm certainly not somebody who says every time you get a successful result, you have to understand the model in detail and you have to understand exactly what the variables are and what all their values are. There's sometimes when you say, come on, what this shows is that texting works. Now, I think the circumstances in which you, you want to say, come on, it's okay, are really, however, rather limiting or rather, rather particular cases. The first thing I think is that the intervention is or appears to be very well specified, you just send a text. That is the intervention, and the text has the following word, text, in it. Um, and there's no ambiguity about that. It can't go wrong at that point. The second thing is that the logic model looks fairly good. This is a rather simple idea, really, isn't it, that people these days read texts, and if they read a text, they're more likely to pay the fine than if they're not communicated with at all, or if they fail to take a telephone call, or if they read a letter. That is not a very elaborate story. We sort of feel comfortable with that story. And we also think, and again, it's not quite clear why we think this, but we do think, don't we, that the context, let's say the values of the variables, doesn't matter because this is going to work for a wide range of values of the variables. It's worked on average in Exeter or wherever it may be, and we don't think it's going to make very much different if we do it somewhere else, because the variables that are relevant are going to, have, going to be within the rather wide range of values which allow this thing to work. I'll just make the obvious point, though, that if that set of beliefs are true in the favorable case, it's a very simple intervention, the logic model, is e logic model is easy, and the values of the variables don't matter. The, the RCT has told you nothing at all about whether you should accept those propositions. All the RCT has told you is that it worked. You then go on to say, aha, if it worked, I bet it's because, so and so and so and so. But you have to get that from somewhere else. You have to get it from somewhere else, not from the RCT. So if the question is, what role do RCTs play? One role that RCTs cannot play is help you in that particular case to know that the intervention is simple, so and so and so, so That's not what they're up to. What they do is what they do. They don't do other things, and there are lots of other things they need to do. I mentioned that the intervention um, is, needs to be well specified. Often interventions aren't well specified. I mean, there's, there's an example which my colleagues at LSE have worked on, which is the stroke units case. That's to say that RCTs were done on the effectiveness of having stroke units in hospitals. And on the, on the basis of those favorable results, the, uh, a directive, there was a directive that hospitals should have stroke units. 
If you look at the directive, or if my colleagues who have looked at the directive have seen that the, it doesn't really say what a stroke unit is. A stroke unit is meant to be, and I paraphrase because I can't remember, a stroke unit is meant to be a dedicated space with stroke unit over the door, and in it are, are a, a number of specialists who are good in a complementary, interdisciplinary way at dealing with strokes. However, the, it is not specified in the directive exactly who you have to have and so on, so plainly the intervention is going to differ a lot from one place to another according to money or what people you've got or where it may be. And unlike the case of texting, where we believe that the intervention was that text, here you don't know what it is. Another case is if you're in child welfare and you have an intervention which is leave the child with the family, quite plainly that isn't very well specified. I mean, you can see what the words mean, but what it actually amounts to depends on what the family is like. So it, you, 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 the intervention is often not well specified, so that if you find that a stroke unit on RCT on stroke units, on RCT on leaving children the family, works, it may not, it may not work at, at all well, certainly in a particular case, because stroke unit and family may not mean the same thing as on average it did in the RCT. I've said, let me just say another thing about where the RCT um, arrangement is very helpful. I've said an RC RCT, I hope, consistently rather carefully, because I think again, if you have an intervention and you use it again and again and again, you RCT it again and again and again all over the place, in different contexts, different countries, different kinds of people, different populations and so on, and it works again and again and again, I think you then have an inductive argument. You just say, I bet it'll work there, this new place where I haven't RCT'd it. And why do I? I think that for the same reason I think the sun's going to rise tomorrow morning. I think the sun's going to rise tomorrow, tomorrow morning because I've, I've got no understanding at all of astronomy or the heavenly bodies or anything of that kind, but it did yesterday. And I've no idea what the model is, what the conditions have to be for it to rise tomorrow. I just think it's going to rise tomorrow because it always does rise. Similarly, if I have an intervention which again and again and again scores, I'm just going to say to myself, well, whatever the model is, the caus causation model here, is present all over and the variables are in the right state for it to work all over. So I'm going to keep, um, so I'm going to keep uh, uh, doing this intervention. And similarly, I think the my colleague Nancy Cartwright doesn't think this. Um, I think that if you uh, do an RCT on a population which is a part of your ultimate target population, so if you're doing, if you're doing the RCT in Birmingham and then you're going, to put, you're going to apply it in Birmingham, you've got reasonable grounds for believing that your test population is a good represent, representative of the whole population, then you are on reasonable grounds for saying that you um, will be, can you move from saying it worked in the test population to it works in the target population. So this is just not exactly being polite to RCTs, but just pointing out the obvious thing, that you, 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 you've got to be sensible about this. If it keeps on working, then it works, even if you don't understand how. And the second thing is, if it worked in the place where you're going to do it, do it in that place, because you're going to work in that place. Um, I mentioned failures of rollouts, and sometimes these failures are seen as being a sort of problem of implementation. It works really, but it didn't work here because we didn't do it right. Now, you can see this is a sort of, can be an immunization strategy. It's saying that even though it didn't work, in some other sense of works, it does work, but not didn't work here. That's to say there's almost no evidence of not working that is going to make you feel that this doesn't work after all. Um, I think that there's one version of this which I think called the IKEA implementation version, which is absolutely right. Um, contrary to rumour, it is pretty much true that if you take the IKEA kit home and it doesn't work, that's because you haven't followed the instructions. And the, you can describe that perfectly sensibly as a failure of implementation, meaning you didn't do it right. And if that's the problem with the failure of the intervention in social policy, or whatever it may be, there is a perfectly good, it's perfectly good to describe that as being a failure of implementation and to say that what you ought to do in future is implement it right. But I think implementation, lots of the time, just acts as a sort of... Um, rubbish being shorthand for we must have done something wrong. And then 
what we've done wrong really has got to be looked at a bit more carefully. I mean, in, term, in the spirit of the way I've been talking, what we may have done wrong is to put the intervention into a context where it's not going to work. We may just not have made, we made, a, we made a mistake about what the model was, what the value of the variables was. It just doesn't work here, you know. The classic case is Tennessee small classes and California small classes. There, it was just, they, they made a mistake about how the intervention should operate. Um, so that's, it was a mistake to try it here. And it may be, and this gets you into very difficult water, I think that it would have worked if only we'd varied a bit, it varied it a bit. If only we'd realised that um, in this particular community, I don't know what, um, Fridays are a special day, so it's no good doing it on Friday. Uh, and that is something which only we'd ha we just used our sense. We'd have said, oh, well, we've just got to shift the day or something of that kind. But variation is tricky because there is another story about with RCTs or policy rollouts or whatever, which is the story of fidelity. That if you've got an intervention and it's RCT and it's successful, when you then roll it out, what you've got to do is be faithful to the intervention. You've got to do the same thing again. Otherwise, it doesn't really work. Or otherwise, you don't know what you've done, so you don't know why it hasn't worked. If you're faithful, then you are on sure ground. Um, fidelity sometimes seems to be a good thing and sometimes doesn't. I mean, in the, in the mouths of those who um, sell packages based on RCTs. In the manuals for both functional family therapy and PATH, both of which are American packages, um, you're encouraged to use your judgment to adapt the program to your circumstances. Now, I think we like the sound of that. It seems to be a good idea, doesn't it? If this intervention is really promising because of the RCT, but it needs to be adapted a bit because this is the, the, these circumstances are different to the ones in which it was, it, was, it was done, then we ought to adapt it. But all I can say about this again, you know, I'm answering the question, the RCT, of course, doesn't in itself tell you at all anything about how you ought to adapt the intervention to particular circumstances. That is something which you have to get from somewhere else, which is loosely called, well, I'll talk about that later. Um, one way of dealing with that problem is to talk rather, hopefully, I think, about saying, yes, well, you see, if you've got an intervention, an intervention, the intervention that was tested by the RCT has got some core features, which you interfere with at your peril, and it's got some surface features, which you're allowed to play around with because they don't really matter. Now, that may be right. I mean, I think it's simply restating that you've got to use your intelligent judgment about what variations are going to, to be legitimate and which aren't. But, of course, the RCT cannot tell you anything about what the core features and the surface features of programs are because the RCT doesn't actually tell you anything about the program except that it works. I mean, it just doesn't, isn't in the business of giving you that information. And to put it more generally, there's no way to determine deductively what types of difference will affect the generalizability of what types of finding, findings. Patrick also re referred to resistance. Now, resistance um, has, um, there are many reasons for resistance, good or bad. Uh, I think one of the reasons that professionals find it often very uncomfortable to accept all this stuff is that they've got a different story in their head about what their job is and how they're meant to carry it out. And I think it's something to do with, and this just needs a huge amount of... Um, there's a, I was quoting the other, the other day the end of the paper that Ben Goldacre wrote recently for the EEF, the Educational Endowment Foundation. Um, where he's, as usual, saying RCTs are really, really good, but he also says that professional judgment matter, matters. And at the end of the last page, he says, of course, everybody knows that RCTs can't give you everything. You have to exercise judgment as well. Um, and you will turn the page hoping to find that you're going to be told how to exercise professional judgment into this blank page. And there is a blank page, more or less, in our thinking about what professional judgment is for. And it matters because not just is that the idea of professional judgment is one of the sources of resistance, but because if it's right that you need, for example, to adapt programs, then you've got to decide how and whether to adapt them. And that does seem to be a non-deductive, open-ended, judgmental, messy, non-objective sort of activity, which we all feel pretty uncomfortable with, except we all know that you need to do it all the time. Because I think the professionals think that they're good at 
when they're looking at an individual, which they do a lot of the time, they're good at looking at members of subpopulations, because remember RCTs give you average results. And there are lots of subpopulations within the population that you are doing the RCT on. And I think, well, I think that um, professionals think they're good at saying, well, this child, this patient, they may not use this phraseology, is a member of a subpopulation, which in the RCT, if only we knew it, probably didn't do very well out of the intervention. We need another one. They think they're good at adapting programs to making the solution fit the program, to fit the individual, and so on. And this is what is all rather unhelpfully called judgment. Judgment just being a phrase coined or used, and traditionally used, to describe doing all that stuff. They think they know what model is relevant here and what may be the values of the relevant variables, though, again, of course, they don't necessarily use that language. So I hope you will see that my talk is not an anti-RCT talk. What it is an attempt to do is to see what RCTs do contribute to the success, let's say, to be optimistic, of a policy intervention. They tell you something very specific, that it worked. They tell you very little indeed about how to generalize. In fact, strictly speaking, I think they tell you nothing about how to generalize. They, it isn't at all clear what they tell you, that it isn't as simple, the, the, what we, the problem we have to solve in deciding that it works is, is more difficult than deciding whether it worked. It involves all the stuff that I have loosely put under the umbrella of implementation. And I think it's perfectly plain that a successful policy implementation or a successful policy intervention is successful because all sorts of things have worked together. One of them is that you may well have started off with an RCT, which gives you the idea that this thing is capable of working. It did work here. There is a model somewhere of how these things work, which was exemplified in the black box in the RCT. And so what we have is the hopeful conclusion from the RCT that it can work. But it's a very, very long way from that to deciding it will work here. And it's a very, very long way from that to deciding um, how it is that you will implement it in a particular context. <coughs> Thank you very much, Jeremy. Um, we will hold on to your questions, uh, write them down. Uh, we're going to go straight from our first to our second speaker and reserve all the questions until the end. So, Leon. Yeah. Right, thank you. Hi. So it, it was interesting uh, talking to Jeremy uh, before in terms of the roles that we would each take on this debate. I think uh, I would have been very comfortable actually doing the uh, the uh, challenge to the uh, proposition that RCTs are the answer to all social policy questions. I'm certainly not going to argue that they are. Um, however, I do want to argue, and indeed, uh, I have just taken a job as head of evidence in the Early Intervention Foundation, which is one of the new What Works centres. Um, and so it would be slightly hypocritical not to attempt to make the case uh, for the randomised control trial. But I'm, I'm certainly not going to argue that all social policy questions can be reduced to a randomized control trial. I've just spent the last five years doing mixed methods research in government precisely because of the importance of bringing frontline and uh, citizen perspectives to bear on policy questions. So uh, this isn't an either or debate, and <laughs> Jeremy has, has made that very clear in his very balanced comments uh, on, on the kind of anti side. Um, but what I do want to argue, I'd like to just talk a little bit about what we're doing as a What Work Centre. Um, and to sort of anchor the discussion a little bit in the context of the kinds of decision making for which recognition of the value of the model of a randomized control trial might be useful. So my, the, 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 the sort of the center point of my argument is, 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 is going to be about really about learning and about accountability. And that for, uh, for, for uh, holding uh, commissioners and politicians to account for their decisions, it's really important to be able to attribute some degree of cause and have a good understanding of what the impact of policy is. Um, so I think there's a very strong case for emphasizing the importance of evaluation and recognizing that that is very difficult for many reasons, but nonetheless, that thinking and understanding the way policy works 
the way uh, the challenges of design, the challenges of implementation, and the challenges of measurement and understanding of impact. The randomized control trial gives you a very good framework and a very good model for, for developing thinking and improving policy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some natural experiments and some other examples where it's not that the randomized control trial is the solution to everything, but the, the thinking behind it, I think, is a very useful support to a kind of culture change that the What Work centers are part of. Um, so I, I just want to start by, by talking a little bit about the Early Intervention Foundation and who our real, our core audiences are. Uh, for, for a long time, there's been, a, uh, uh, as, as you'll all have been involved in different ways, a real challenge of trying to improve the quality of evaluation and uh, understanding of impact in, particularly in central government policy. So, so huge initiatives over the years that have come and gone uh, to try to um, bring a culture of evaluation into central government. Um, but there are always reasons why any particular policy, it's just really going to be too hard to evaluate this one. Um, so to a certain extent, this, this challenge has now been, in traditional Whitehall way, cascaded to local government. So we can't get central government ministers quite to really buy into evaluation, it's expensive uh, and you won't be around for the results and all of those kinds of things. So it's sort of cascaded into local government. Um, and I'm, the Early Intervention Foundation uh, is working with 20 places around the country, uh, mainly local authorities, but partnerships across places between local authorities, police and crime commissioners, and uh, 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 clinical commissioning groups, so across police, health, and children's services particularly, um, to try and improve the nature of the investments that our local agencies and authorities are making uh, to support children and young people to, uh, in, in simple terms, have better transitions to adulthood. So the Early Intervention Foundation, it's not all about the early years, it's conception through the transition into adulthood. And we're, we're founded on a recognition that from a lot of evaluation evidence and, and good intervention design evidence, there are a lot of programs that make a difference and that, can, uh, that, and that have good uh, returns to them as investments. But what we don't really know and there's a lot of focus on this question, the extent to which a place can shift its investments out of paying for prisons, custodial units, paying essentially for the cost of failure, shift that money upstream into preventive services that might actually reduce the burden on those later services. And so this is a very, very tangible, real issue in local authorities, many of whom have already had 25% cuts to their budget and have got another third coming down the line. So what's likely to happen is they protect the statutory services at the back end because they often feel they have to do those. They cut the preventive services and with continued stagnation of the real wage and all the rest of it, the growth on the back end of the system just continues to rise. Um, and so that's, that's a, a, a very real concern for local authorities and other agencies. So what they're trying to do is bring evidence to bear on this question, which is why we are uh, being set up. And, and uh, the challenge is to distinguish preventive activity which has been shown to work in the past from preventive activity which is ineffective. And what we're finding is that the places that we're working with are actually desperate for better evidence. They are hungry to improve their evaluation designs. There is huge appetite to do it because they have very, very difficult decisions to make for which they will be electorally accountable in terms of what they cut and what they invest in. And they want to have better evidence and information which interestingly rather replicates my limited experience in central government, having been in the Treasury in the 2010 spending review and seeing the, the, the there's a mixture of views, I would say, amongst, the, amongst politicians and the extent to which people want to make decisions on the basis of their views, on what they're hearing from their constituents, on ideology, on basic principles that they bring to the table, and others who really are desperate for evidence, partly so that they can protect themselves against making the wrong decision, so that they've actually drawn on a transparent evidence base. And the sad reality is that evidence base is not there. 
The, the quality of the information is not there. I want to talk about a particular example of youth policy to sort of explain this a little bit more. Um, so my, before I, I, I went into to, to Treasury in my little way, um, I was uh, a, an academic, as, as Patrick said, um, running a research centre in the Institute of Education that did research for government in different ways, mainly analysis of the cohort studies, although we, we tried to do a lot of mixed methods work. Um, and in, in about 2005 or six, so under the previous administration, there was a sudden realization, a sudden flurry of activity that many here may have been involved in in different ways around youth clubs, around what we provide for our young people out of school. Um, and so we got, uh, uh, we got a call, can we do any analysis of the cohort study to, to test uh, what works, uh, you know, what, what effect do youth clubs have? Um, uh, and as these things are in government, you've got three weeks, we've got to make a decision, the paper's got to be out. Uh, and uh, as, a, as an academic, you always have to balance this issue. Are you going to do your best to provide the best information you can to bear on a question, or are you going to put your hands up and say, well, I can't provide a perfect answer, so make it up yourself. I'm in the business of trying to provide better information rather than worse information. Um, so we did some analysis of the cohort studies, which were, uh, 1970 cohort study, which was very interesting. Um, but of course, it's not a, there's no exogenous variation in that study about who is going to which sorts of youth clubs. So what we found, I should say, you'll all know, the 1970 cohort, huge richness of data. So we can look at who's going to what forms of youth provision at age 16, we can look at outcomes at age 30, age 34, across a whole range of aspects of, of social inclusion and exclusion. And we've got a whole series of early childhood, family development, family context, school achievement, school context, and neighborhood context measures to try to control for in a kind of multivariate regression kitchen sink kind of way. Um, and what we found was all we could really say was where you go at age 16 in the 1970 cohort in 1986, the kinds of youth clubs you go to really matters. It's a really big signal for later outcomes. Taking account of age 10 schooling, age 16 schooling, uh, have you been in trouble with the police, uh, the rutter scales, behavioral assessment, externalizing and internalizing, behavior. huge, we have you know, lots and lots of controls in these studies. Where you go at age 16 really mattered in the sense that even conditioning on, on all those things, kids that were going, and this won't surprise you, kids who were going to church groups, who were going to scouts, who were going to girl guides, much better outcomes. Kids that were going to youth clubs, which were in that, at that time generally unsupervised, uh, unstructured places to hang out with other young people, much worse outcomes. Now, what do you make from this? We've got no way of distinguishing what is the selection bias in this. You know, people make choices. That's part of the nature of social policy. That's why social policy is more difficult than rocket science. Um, uh, and uh, uh, that needs saying more often. Um, people make choices. There is a non-deterministic system. So if you can't take account of the selection bias, as we couldn't, we didn't have any exogenous variation in who is going to what, we couldn't really say much about the results. What's been interesting is for the previous administration, the, the evidence was deemed to be sufficient that there was recognition that where young people go really matters and that we need therefore to invest in the places that young people go. And then there was questions about, well, what kinds of places and what should we invest in? And unfortunately, we didn't have a great deal of evidence to bear on that question. So you get ideology and opinion. Um, it's been interesting though, then being in the Treasury, as I say, during the 2010 spending review, um, I was shocked when uh, Peter Riddell, who's a very distinguished commentator, said at the Institute of Government just before the election, when the government changes, the facts change. And I thought, don't be ridiculous. Facts are facts. I'm an academic. Facts are facts. The facts don't change. The facts completely change uh, in the sense that what people are prepared to listen to, what they take seriously, the questions they ask fundamentally change. So that evidence, because we hadn't addressed selection bias in that study, quite rightly actually, wasn't a very firm foundation for arguing in favor of youth services. But you tell me where the evidence is by which you could actually argue in favor of youth services. Um, and it's not there. 
because we don't have a, I would say, a culture of experimentation and evaluation. And often that does mean having a comparison group. It does mean having pre and post measurement. And it does mean very careful attention to a logic model. And those principles for me come from the model of the randomized control trial. So my argument is not we have to RCT everything. It's never going to be possible. Um, but we do have to bear in mind those principles of thinking about comparison, of thinking about selection effects. Um, I can't tell you the number of studies I see in, uh, in, in local authorities and central government where you're talking about billions of pounds of expenditure and the evaluation that is based on was, has, 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 has no, no comparison group to it at all. Because most people will tell you, why should we collect data on people who aren't getting any treatment? What's, it was just a waste of money. So there isn't a culture of evaluation. And so we're arguing as a What Works Center, we need to support that culture. And it's interesting uh, now talking to these places who are really hungry for better information and evidence, but it's so hard to actually bring the expertise to the table and the data to the table to enable proper testing of the questions that people have. But the purpose of the What Works centers, I would argue, it's not all about randomized control trials, but it is about improving the quality of the information underpinning decision making. I just wanted to mention that. Uh, a couple of studies that, that I've been looking at because I thought they, they help amplify some of those points. Um, so I, I described the, the study we did, the, the, the 1970 cohort study in terms of youth clubs. Um, that study had no control for selection. But there is a, a, a famous study from the US in the, in the 80s, the um, Adolescent Transitions Program, which as a US study did have a comparison group. Uh, it was a, a, a program intended to support young boys, 14 to 18, uh, 12 to 16, who were considered to be at risk of what is called in that part of the American literature delinquency in terms of getting into trouble, uh, smoking, early drug use, and so on. Um, where there was a series of interventions. There was a, a peer-based intervention where they were in a group with other peers. There was a parent-based intervention where they were, their parenting, uh, where the parents were supported with a series of interventions to try and enable the parent to better address the issues of these young boys. There was a group that got both. Um, and then there was what they call a control group who got a series of videos, uh, which was meant to be a placebo. Although it's interesting now, I see money's cut, there's a lot more attention to can we use videos to actually really have effect. But the idea was that would have no effect at all. Um, what they found was, and so it's a relatively small sample, and I wouldn't want to overstate it, and I'm sure there are issues of implementation design here, um, though I understand it has been replicated. Um, but it was interesting what they found. So after three months, the group that had the focus on the parenting um, and the focus on the, on the collective activity, the, the, the peer activity, which was slightly structured, um, at both of those groups, so three of the, the four groups compared to the control group, all had improvements in the quality of the parent young person interaction. So as assessed by a set of external uh, coders, they reckoned that they, these programs had improved the quality of the parent-child interaction, um, which you think might be a good thing if that's your logic model for how all this is going to benefit. Um, they then went back three months later, and importantly three years later, and found that the group that had the peer attendance program whether with the parent program or not, all had much worse, on their definition of delinquency, much worse delinquency than the control group or the group that just had the parenting program. And the reason for that was, they argue, and there's a question here about the extent to which, and it'd be an interesting question for discussion, the extent to which an evaluation design, a randomized control trial can help you think about mechanism, because I'm not sure I entirely agree. Um, their argument, uh, as a, perhaps a, a, an ex post explanation of that phenomenon was that it was about what happened in the peer interactions. Um, and for me, this is a really important study because it emphasizes the importance as people, as the agents of change. 
there is a tendency to think about, you know, from a policy-making government perspective, what can the government do? What can we invest in? Where can we spend our money? How can we change laws? How can we change regulations? Um, but actually, it was the interactions between the, the young boys themselves that was driving the outcome. And as I say, there are other studies from, from Sweden I've seen where they assess the quality of the peer group and, and the worse the quality of the peer group, if you'll accept that language in terms of degree of delinquency within the peer group, the worse the long-term consequences were of grouping those young boys together. And what uh, Tom Dishon, who wrote that study, described that as conduct disorder training. Um, and we're very familiar with it in a, in a, in a prison context, this, this notion of aggregating problems together. And actually, we still do it quite a lot uh, in, in, in pupil referral units and in other contexts, even though there's very good evidence that that will be more damaging than any positive effect that might come out of the program. Um, so you know, an, an example where uh, doing something as a randomized controlled trial doesn't solve all the problems in, on its own, but it does enable a better understanding of some of the issues involved in the policy. If I've got time, I just want to mention a, a, a couple of other studies which are also interesting because they, they emphasize this point um, uh, that there are, you know, there, it's very hard to do evaluation, it's very hard to do a randomized control trial, but that we need to think about that exogenous variation and find the exogenous variation so that we can have better understanding of policy outcomes. So I just want to talk a bit, and I realize again, there will be people in this audience, very expert audience, who will probably know a lot more about these studies than I do, uh, so perhaps themes for discussion later. Um, but I want to talk about the, the, the GoTro experiment, or the GoTro program in, the, in, in, in Chicago, um, and moving to opportunity. So this was a set of uh, activities. GoTro was the uh, legislated solution to court cases in the US around racial discrimination. So this was uh, black American families, African American families who had been living in very segregated, uh, very uh, uh, ra uh, racially segregated areas in Chicago, who won a court case uh, about the way the housing policy of Chicago had worked in the in the earlier period that enabled them to be moved to other places. It wasn't a randomized control trial. It wasn't an experiment, but it was a natural experiment in the sense that they didn't get to choose where they moved to. They, there was a policy, there was a, a legal decision that they would be moved to much less racially segregated areas. Um, but in practice, about one-fifth of the families were moved to areas that were only a little bit less racially segregated. Four-fifths were moved to areas that were much less racially segregated. Um, and this has been a big issue in America where uh, uh, Julius Wilson's research and others talking about the neighborhood effects and the importance of place on communities and on community outcomes. People were very interested to study uh, the outcomes and that, of that and see, well, what long-term difference did it make whether people were moved from a racially segregated area to a much less, to a, a racially integrated area or not. And the natural experiment enabled uh, a study of that question. Um, I'll talk about the outcomes of that in a moment. But I also want to mention there was an, another study in the, later on, that was in the 80s. In the late 90s, there was a study called Moving to Opportunity, where they took the results of GoTro and thought, well, this is quite a good policy. We should do this. So five cities did it. And they did it as a randomized control trial. So they deliberately, uh, uh, there was a lottery, basically. And they split the families into five groups. Four of those groups got to move one-fifth of the, the, the families didn't get to move. Interestingly, because randomized control trials never really quite work the way you think they're going to, the fifth of families that didn't get to move decided to move anyway. <laughs> right? But they didn't get to move as far or into uh, as advantaged areas as those who were moved through the program. So again, you've got something that's between a randomized control trial and a natural experiment. But both had elements of randomness. 
So even in the Gautreau, um, where you got moved to was, was more or less, though it's not perfect, more or less the decision of the, the rental agents who were managing the program. So in both examples, you've got a bit of exogenous variability, which enables you to look at long-term implications for these African-American families of moving from very racially segregated neighborhoods to much less racially segregated neighborhoods. And the results are interesting. Um, a lot is made in the studies of this that residential mobility was stable. So not just did the family settle in the new areas, but their children settled in the new areas. Um, and, and, and this is a very American kind of policy, I think. I don't think we're actively proposing this as a policy, this kind of residential mobility. It's more of an indirect byproduct of, of, uh, of various policies. Um, but important to think about some of the implications of these kinds of residential moves. What they found in, 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 in Gautreau was initially there was an improvement in the, a big improvement in the mental health of the mothers. Um, and these were families who were moving from very high crime areas to much less crime areas. So there's much less violence in the neighborhoods and you see a, a, a really substantial impact in the mental health of the mothers. Um, interestingly, in, in, in both studies, um, you don't find um, effects on the school success of the children um, and the effects on, on, on problem behaviours are, 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 were, were positive for female children uh, and negative for, for the boys. Um, and uh, um, so, uh, interesting. I mean, one of the reasons why I was quite interested in this GoTro study is that they, these, these are long term results over, 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 over decades. Um, and actually, on employment and economic sustainability as well, they didn't find very big effects. Um, they were initially from the GoTro study, um, but not from the Moving to Opportunity study. Um, so an interesting set of, of differences. So mental health improved, economic sufficiency didn't very much, school success didn't in the comparisons between the, the, the locations that the different groups went to. And for boys, there were real problems of, of, of subsequent criminality and delinquency, even worse than had they stayed in their original neighborhoods. Um, so what they did in the GoTro study is go, is go and do qualitative investigation. And they talk to the families and they talk to the, 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 the young people now grown up and they try to understand what these outcomes were, what explained these outcomes. So for one thing, the families didn't tend, didn't tend to send their children to the good local neighborhood schools. Partly because they, they, they either thought they wouldn't fit in or they thought these schools aren't for people like us or interesting, there was quite a predominant view that actually schooling doesn't matter very much. So there's a quote in the study, if you take a kid with a hard head, there's no point sending him to a good school. Right? It doesn't matter what school you go to. It was a kind of cultural view uh, that, was, that was predominating. So for all kinds of reasons, the school effect didn't happen. The, the behavior effects, you, 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 you can work out for yourself. So these, these, these uh, African-American boys moved to relatively well-off neighborhoods where they really struggled to form friendship bonds with the kids around them. They reverted back to their old neighborhoods um, and indeed got into more trouble than otherwise might have happened because they now had the sense of being excluded in two places. Um, so, you know, the, the program didn't have a positive effect there. Uh, the mothers struggled to find permanent employment because they'd lost their networks of access to the jobs market. The, the kind of contacts by which they would find access to jobs they had lost when they moved. And they spent a lot of time actually going back to their old neighborhoods because that was where the social cohesion was. So I'm not, I should come to an end, I'm not recommending this as a policy. It's a very, to me, it's a slightly strange, slightly strange way of approaching policy, um, but it fits within an American context. But the point I wanted to make is no, nobody should argue that doing a randomized control trial is easy, that you, there's a set of buttons and you push it and you've got your randomized control trial and off you go. We've got to look for natural experiments. Even when we do randomized control trials, we have to find the ways of testing whether we've got the genuine exogenous variability and the random stratification and the accurate allocation to the different groups. All of Jeremy's points about implementation are, 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 are really uh, huge and important. So when we as a, as a What Works Center, um, What Works is a label. Right, so, so you know, I gave up trying to argue with politicians about how you put things. I find now, Tana can, can tell you, in, in, in our center, there's now a, almost a unit that is there to translate 
what I say into, into English that is a form that you can communicate through the media because uh, apparently people aren't ready to talk about exogenous variability. And so on, I don't know. Um, but, it, you know, so it is difficult. But the, the what works thing is, 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 I want to argue, an important attempt to try and create a cultural shift to emphasize better data, better evidence, and better understanding in order to support decision making. Um, and the randomized control trial is a very useful, uh, I would say, in terms of the Maryland hierarchy, to have that at the top as a sort of objective for thinking about how to improve from where you are is very useful. And so we'll, we will be using it in, in, in those terms. Um, so I should stop there. Uh, I'd, I'd like to respond to some of the other comments that, that, that Jeremy made, but perhaps those things will be picked up in the discussion. Um, so I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Leon. I'm assuming these microphones work here. Um, so if I could ask you to uh, put your hand up if you have a question. And uh, when you, if I call you to give a question, could you say who you are and what your affiliation is? I'll stand here, went up first. If you could stand up so the speakers maybe could see you as well. I think it's David Walker there. You've got a mic. Is there a mic coming around for David? David Walker, Leon just spoke about the culture shift. Uh, forgive me for asking what will obviously be a political question. How do you explain the paradox of this explosion of interest in apparent interest in evidence, what work centers, the fact we're having this debate this evening, and the operation of what many people believe to be the most ideological governments in 2005, producing social policies, welfare, education, and are completely evidence free, unmodeled. And not evaluate. How do you explain this apparently? I can't. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a good point. I, and, you know, that's... There is, I have this debate. So the chair of the Early Intervention Foundation is an MP, Graham Allen, the MP for Nottingham, who's been a, a, an incredible advocate for early intervention, who also has a very strong belief in what he calls political primacy. Right, so at the end of the day, the politicians are elected and they make the decisions. And that is our system of government. The point about the, 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 the What Works Network and the emphasis on better evaluation is to try and support a culture change that in, ultimately it is the electorate that hold the politicians to account. It is strange to me that we have a, a debate about the macroeconomy in which the fact that we now have some economic growth means that our macroeconomic policy has been right, as though there was no counterfactual. Um, we, and, and, you know, the fact that statisticians and, 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 and other experts might, might, might want a counterfactual and recognize that doesn't enable the public to hold the government to account. So I would just say in answer, you, you make a really important point, but we have to start from where we are and improve public understanding. Jeremy, do you have anything to... Yes, I have a couple of observations which are not based on the inside experience that you've had. Um, it was interesting going to the launch, was it at Nesta, of the What Works Centres. Obviously, a bit of it was that if you have substantial public expenditure cuts or believe you're having substantial public expenditure cuts, efficiency gets into it and you want to make sure that you spend your money on things that work. I mean, it's, it's plain that Danny Alexander was emphasising that a great deal because he was the person who had the money hadn't got much of it, and he wanted to make sure it was well spent. So, and of course, the arguments in favour of evidence-based policy are exactly the same whether you're rich or poor. I mean, that, that, that doesn't hang together, but I think that is a reason. The other thing is, I think this is a replay also of what you might call the, the technocrat versus the politician again. I mean, the, the, a, a lot of this talk here is slightly esoteric. I mean, because surely one of the great impulses for evidence-based policy is to stop politicians coming back from the weekend, from the constituents of the golf course or whatever, and having a bright idea. And this, uh, and, and this is not limited to politicians in business. People are always having bright ideas. And you have an exhausting process of trying to examine whether this bright idea really stands up. But politicians are, for all sorts of cultural and other reasons, in favor of the bright idea which is sometimes a slogan, sometimes a silver bullet, and so on. And the technocrats are always against it. The technocrats' job is to sigh and say, are you sure, can we think about this? And this, in a way, is just a rerun of the are you sure, can we think about it story, which is, has got a very, very long history. And of course, we all in this room, being technocratic-ish, really want people like us 
to be run in the country on the basis of evidence and principles and so on that we think we are the custodians and trustees of and the politicians want to do the politics. And it's very, very difficult to see how that's ever going to go wholly away. Okay, I can also assure you that the government had no influence in us organising this event this evening. So, um, there was a question right at the back there. I saw a hand go up. Uh, yeah, you. So, say who you are. And... Thanks, from City Uni. Um, I was interested, Jeremy, when you said um, about the proliferation of packages developed. Uh, people selling packages on the back of basket keys. And I wondered if both panel members could talk a bit about how we can encourage natural experiments so that we can have a proliferation of focus on more upstream um, interventions. Well, the reason I mentioned this, and this is rather a narrow answer to your question, I don't know how to encourage natural experiments. Um, I, I, the, I can, and, and, and as you know, I have got considerable business background, so I'm not against business. But I know from having been chairman of an IT company that what you have to do in order to make money out of IT is to decide what kind of business you're in. One business is the business providing packages, let's say, to keep it simple, a, a word processing package. A characteristic of which is that it's more or less general purpose. People understand what it is. You come in the store and you buy it, and it will do the job, and you can make a lot of money with that, or to provide consultancy. Now, there's a tendency, if you commercialise things, to, to uh, prioritise making packages and to overclaim what packages can do. And in my language, overclaiming what packages can do is being over-optimistic about the generalizability of a single of a single solution. And I think it's built into commercialization that you're likely to do that a very a great deal rather than the alternative which I take is what you're talking about when you're um, encouraging natural experimentation is to to apply yourself rather more to the particularities of the situation that you find yourself in and to, to try and produce a, 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 a not prepackaged solution so I think and you know I think there is a problem about the commercialization of educational packages for example for that reason. Interesting, thank you. I, I, uh, you call it proliferation, pr proliferation of packages. In the past, I've, I've, I've been very concerned about the boutique of interventions. This idea you go to the shop, you pick the best yeah, intervention yeah, sure. off the shelf. They've all been randomized control trials, of, of course, by uh, enterprises that have the resources to enable them to do that and then to sell them on. And it, it, this is something we, we pick up a lot in, in our conversations with places. Often the, the kind of boutique interventions will be much more expensive than trying to work with your existing workforce. Often they are an alternative to that which is provided by your existing workforce. So again, you, know, you, you, you can't get away from the, the, the politics or the, you know, the, the resource allocation aspects to what is underpinning this debate about what works, that decisions are being made here that are going to influence jobs and livelihoods and, 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 and ultimately well-being. Um, so what, what we're hearing from our places is actually they don't just want to hear about programs that work because of, you can't just always slot them into your existing set, or, set of, uh, of, of, of activities. What's needed is understanding about how to improve practice about how to work with existing workforces. And, and actually, it's the questions about practice and about systems that the places themselves are asking. They are asking about programs, but often the question about programs is, I want to know about what works so I can work out how I can do it on the cheap, um, which, which is not necessarily uh, going to be very productive. Uh, and there's a really interesting question about the relationship between fidelity and quality of intervention, which perhaps we, we, we might get into as well. But I just really want to emphasise it's not all about programmes. And the, the What Works debate generally has, has moved away from that. So I see Rachel Tuffin uh, sat very near you. Uh, we talk about uh, the, the work that the, the, the National College of Policing is doing around supporting uh, the practice of police officers or the Education Endowment Fund, the practice of teachers and head teachers, which is not all about buying in an intervention that you could add on the top. So it's a really, really important point. Uh, there was, you at the back there, the glasses? Um, good evening, Arnaud Vaganet from the London School of Economics. Um, I'd like to apologize to the chair because um, I'm going to do his job <laughs> in a way. I'd like to um, propose a sort of a synthesis to um, our speakers and see if they agree with this uh, synthesis. 
Um, I understand that uh, from, from your talks that um, RCTs are, are possible in a number of um, contexts, circumstances, policy areas. Um, they're possible, they're desirable also. Um, however, the more um, political salient or the more controversial um, a reform is, and then the less these RCTs are both possible and desirable. So what do you think of that? Thank you. Shall I go first? I hope, I hope the question is clear. Well, I, I think that so, so far as they're desirable, I think they're desirable. <laughs> they're, 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 this evidence-based policy is only meant to do one thing, which is to draw attention to the fact that you need to know the facts that are relevant to the policy decision. Now, that remains true, I think, regardless of whether the policy that's being proposed is politically desirable or otherwise. And I, I do think that, I was talking about te te technocracy earlier, I think that the version of labor is fairly plain. What you're doing, for example, with RCTs is using statistical techniques to show that something works or worked or whatever your claim is. Nobody thinks that that's the end of the matter. And I don't mean by that there's implementation as well. Of course, if there isn't the money, it'll lose you the next election. You can't get it through the cabinet. The parliamentary timetable is um, too congested. It won't actually get into effect. So any of this evidence-based policy stuff only does one thing, which is to, to say so far as we can use evidence to to prophesy effectiveness, we believe that this is likely to be effective or not. There are then very many large, large number of other um, factors that come into it, like is it popular, is it possible, and so on. But that doesn't stop that job being a thing that can be done separately and well or badly. But maybe I missed the point of the question. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I'd, li I'd like to uh, sort of bring that back also to, to part of the, uh, the last question that, that, I, that I didn't answer, which was about how do we actually enable more of this natural experimental activity to, to happen? And, and, and um, so in terms of is it desirable or feasible, the, the, the more uh, controversial or higher profile the policy issue, I would say the more, from my perspective, the more desirable it is, absolutely, and the less feasible. Um, there are some quite important examples, I think, like children's centres. Um, or Sure Start, where we're in very, very difficult territory because things weren't rolled out in an evaluatable way. And so both sides can read the evidence to support the position that they want. And we can't have a very uh, uh, rich uh, evidence-based discussion about what the future should be for children's centres. And I personally think that's a disgrace. I think it's, it's appalling. And I think we ought to do everything we can to ensure that important policies like that are rolled out in ways that mean we can learn about whether what within them works and how to improve them. And just in, in terms of the, the, the previous question as well, the key for me, and I, I should have mentioned this in the, in the talk, is about improving measurement. Um, and I say that with some trepidation to this audience. Um, but I think we, sh we think too much, and it's partly, for, I'm from an economics background, too much about the selection bias and the random allocation and not enough about the measurement of outcomes and what we're actually trying to achieve and the way we use data to understand what is happening to our populations. So one of the reasons it's really hard to do a natural experiment or a, indeed a randomized control trial is that you have to create the data yourself normally. You're normally doing a survey and it's costing hundreds of thousands of pounds possibly to do the survey on the group that get the treatment. And you try to say to a local authority facing all these cuts in its budgets, you don't just have to collect the data on the people that have this program, you've got to collect it on some other people you're not even doing anything with, and it's going to cost an extra £100,000, which is 10 nursery nurses. Uh, and, you know, so you know that, that, that they're not going to do it. And this comes back to issues which we're not getting into today, I guess, about data and data storage and data linkage and the way administrative data is used and made available to local government to enable them to better understand what the impact of their, their policies is. So I think there's a lot we can do if we use data better and then bring the expertise of people who understand the challenge of creating good comparison groups uh, to look at what is, to, uh, we also need to understand the policy landscape. What is being rolled out? Where is it being rolled out? Where is it not being rolled out and why? And if we understood all that better we'd, and had better measurement, we'd have lots of natural experiments. Good one. Um, I'm Eileen McKibben, I'm Research and Evaluation Manager at Kent County Council, so Hi. <laughs> we had a conversation about um, 
One of the things that um, so we're trying to encourage that culture of experimentation and evaluation is quite interesting. And a few other comments around maybe think about what sometimes you'll hear from service managers and practitioners. Really, I guess I'm asking for reflections. But it comes down to if you think something is going to work and you want to evaluate whether or not it makes a difference. What the words I'll hear is often unethical. People are deeply uncomfortable with if you think something's going to work. Why aren't you providing it to these others? And when it comes to decision makers at practitioner level and service manager level how it is encouraging that culture and understanding of what that is from, from their point of view to get them on board. So any reflections on that would be helpful? That's a great question. And a very difficult one. Um, th this, that's, the, that's the huge, huge barrier. I mean, whether, whether it's uh, perceived or real, there is not a culture there is not a, a, a view that it is all right to experiment on people. And, and when we talk to program officers, that is precisely the thing that they're talking about. There, there are other barriers, like people want to determine who gets what intervention. They don't want it to be randomized, because that takes away their professional judgment. Um, uh, so I mean, I, 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 I don't have a great answer for that. I mean, I, others do, and, and, and you know, there are there may be people here who, who might provide a, a better answer. I mean, for me, it comes back to this thing about finding the natural experiments, and we ought to be measuring the outcomes for all of these groups anyway. So you don't, uh, but there are still uh, huge ethical issues about what data is seen by who and who knows what when. So I, I think at the end of the day, we just have to have this argument. And, and, uh, and, and Jeremy's right, the, the, the thing, it's, it's true in tough times and good times as in tough times, but in tough times when in the local authority you're going to have to close two of three services and you're trying to decide which one, I think it's easier to argue that we need to know whether it works. We think it works, but we don't know. And it, it, you know, it, there is a kind of bravery. Well, I, I, I didn't talk about the title of the, the um, peer group paper I described. Uh, partly why I picked it is it's called When Interventions Harm. And for me, the first rule of social policy is first do no ill. And I think we really have to hold our policymakers to account on that. So there, I don't have a simple answer, but I think we just have to argue the case. There's one answer which I can't get right because I, I'm not, I haven't thought it through. I mean, RCTs are a particular statistical, statistical technique, and they're, they're, there are things you can say about it. There are lots of other statistical techniques around. I mean, you mentioned, you, you talk about mixed methods, and mixed methods means there are things other than RCTs. And natural experiments or econometrics, there are all sorts of things uh, where you can get, let's say, good results good answers to the questions you're asking, which don't have this particular problem. Mm. And one answer to your question, I mean, there is a hard, there's a hard nose due to utilitarian argument, which say, come on, some of human happiness discounted at such and such a rate over the next 50 years will be improved very substantially if we do this RCT and we get the good intervention. And it's really bad luck that some of these kids didn't get it. But in this calculus. Now, I think that just doesn't, that doesn't run in two senses. Firstly, it doesn't run with the professionals. The second is it doesn't really run with me either. And I wouldn't like to say why. But I do think there's some hope in the idea that there are other statistical and similar techniques around that might give you good results without that, um, without, without that, without that, that, that difficulty. Uh, and of course, there are designs where everybody gets something. And, yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, sorry, you, yes, with your hand up there. You, yes. <laughs> Hi, Kevin McConnell, Open University. Um, some strange thoughts occurred to me. This is again about the point that the, um, to some extent, that the, uh, the last uh, question raised. Um, Leon said, the point is that there isn't a culture of experimentation and evaluation. It's very important to consider comparison, to consider selection issues. And I think he went on to say, but all that flows from the RCT, or can be thought of as coming from the RCT. Now, I think there's an implementation issue behind all this, and it's the implementation issue of how we implement evidence-based policy making. And my worry is that the concentration of the RCT, and the RCT is a kind of slogan, as this is the way we ought to do it, is a bit damaging, because what I heard you saying in many of these talks was not what I understand happens in most RCTs in a biomedical context. Um, yes, you can point to RCTs in that context, which did show that something works or at least worked. But actually, most of them aren't like that. Most of them provide part of the evidence. They need to be put alongside a whole lot of other um, health economics considerations. That's what NICE does. Um, there's a whole series of things. Um, you know, you don't get funding from the National Institute for Health Research unless there's citizen involvement. They have jargon for it. It's called PPI, um, Patient Public Involvement. Um, 
So a lot of, you know, an RCT in medicine has black box aspects, but it isn't normally a black box entirely because it's surrounded by other aspects of research that are intended to sort of unravel as far as you can. The logic of the Center of Biomedical Researchers uh, wouldn't call it that. Um, so are we kind of setting ourselves up for, fail for failure in this context by concentrating on the RCT rather than concentrating on changing the culture and um, carrying out appropriate comparisons using the comparative method, which predates the ICT by a very long time, and dealing with selection issues in the way you said. I sort of agree with everything you said. Uh, I, 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 would, I, I wouldn't have wanted to say that the, the randomized control trial enables all of those things to happen. That's, that's overstating it. Um, I, I think uh, I have found it useful as a model for emphasizing the importance of comparison groups and pre and post, mod, uh, pre and post measurement and thinking about your logic model. And being, what I like about the notion of an experiment is that you are testing a hypothesis. Um, and we need, I think, policymakers to, to, to understand this notion of hypothesis testing and that that's what evaluation is partly about. So it's, it's supporting innovation, it's supporting uh, you know, a culture where people will try things that won't all work and they will learn the lessons of them. Um, so, you know, for, for, you know, we've set this up as a debate. Uh, you know, I'm arguing in favor of the randomized control trial. Yeah, I, I think really important to recognize there are lots of other ways of enabling that culture. And, and really, culture change has got to depend on bringing a, a lot more people with you than we would achieve if we just talked about randomized control trials. I, I sort of agree with what you've said. I think it's not surprising. I mean, it is a feature of politics, life, what we um, decide to do that we exaggerate and overclaim. I mean, if you think of lots of examples, I mean, if you think of monetarism, if you think of privatization, perfectly good ideas, which just sort of got out of hand because everybody attributed magical people attributed magical, magical properties to them. And I don't mean just politicians, people generally, we do that. And I think RCTs have got a lot going for them in terms of marketing them, if I can put it that way, um, because the slide from it worked to it works is a very easy slide, and it works is a wonderful claim. An absolutely wonderful clip. Um, it, the, the, the statistical logic of RCTs is absolutely stunning. I mean, the idea that you can prove and really prove that there was this intervention that caused that result is an extraordinary thing, extraordinary thing to be able to do. And I think that um, I don't think it's too surprising that if you've got a thing which starts off being called evidence-based policy, or it didn't, let's say it started off being called evidence-based policy, as it were, some technique wins the race and becomes uh, too many claims are made for it and so on, because that's the sort of thing we do. If the world is the, the messier one, which um, Leon thinks it is, as, as I do, where there are a number of techniques, sometimes you can do them, sometimes you can't do them, sometimes they don't tell you what you want, sometimes something else does and so on, that's a very difficult sell. That's a very difficult sell compared with, it's a sort of packaging problem, actually. That's to say that you say, we've got evidence-based problems, policy and you say what's that means mean and I say well I've got this thing called an RCT which shows you what works now that's a very good sell if I say well it's all rather complicated really what you've got to do is look at the circumstances and wonder about it and you've got to do exogenous this now I've lost the audience and I can quite see that if you're in a political process where you want to set up what works centres, and let's say what works centres are a good thing as I think they are the conversation can get vulgar <laughs> okay, we've perhaps got time for one. Could you keep the question short, please? Yeah. Uh, Jane Hutton, University of Warwick. So it's unethical to try to work out which way to teach a child to read when you can easily then adopt the best method. But it's perfectly ethical to give dangerous poisons to people, which is what we do when we do drugs. When we do the what? When we do randomized controlled trials of drugs. Yeah. I do find it amusing that these non-lethal interventions can't be rigorously tested, but lethal interventions have to be. Yeah. Any disagreement with that? <laughs> <laughs> I think that that's agreement from the panel. Um, maybe one, one last short question here at the front. Yeah. Um, Matt, Barn Matt Barnard from the NSPCC. Um, we brought into the RCT 
um, idea quite big with we're running four ICTs. Um, and we can really emphasize very close, um, the, uh, the pain of doing RCDs. We really got that big time. Um, <laughs> so, but we'll end up with some evidence of what has worked. And I don't think any of them we're going to claim that we therefore know what works and not multiple randomized controlled trials. Um, so there's a question, given all that pain, how many, when do we stop doing RCTs if we really want to save in all contexts? Because I'm not sure we could justify to our trustees and our stakeholders doing another RCT of the same intervention. Well, that may be a remark about your trustees rather than about the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, but because, but I, I mean, I think there is a general problem in this, which is there are no general answers to questions of that kind. All you can say in the answers to questions of that kind, you stop when you feel you've got a good grasp of the logic mo model of the relevant variables, and when the generalizability becomes, you're quite confident in them. There's, there's no, there's nothing, you cannot say in advance that you, I mean, I think you, if you end up doing 42, you've probably gone too far. But there's nothing that tells you whether you should stop at two or three or four. You have to apply your critical intelligence to what you've got out of the results of these trials, which includes, I absolutely agree, that when you do the trial, you do ask yourself, particularly if it doesn't work, why didn't it work? What's gone wrong with my logic model? We started this off with a logic model, and we thought it was going to work, but it didn't work, so what's gone wrong? Now, that learning process is one which should go on as long as it's fruitful. That's all you can say. You can have a, an arbitrary rule if you want, which is not more than five. But that's not actually intellectually based on anything except that people are like, as a trustee, I would say these people are likely to spend too much money, I'll make it only five. But that's not a very, that's not an intellectually rigorous answer. Yeah. You, go so, on, you go on as long as it's fruitful. So replication is very important, but it wouldn't necessarily be you that needs to be replicating. Um, uh, so I, I hope what you're, you're saying is that uh, you wouldn't, the, the, the experience has been difficult, so you would be very careful about what further randomized controlled trials you did, and you would be seeking to do them on new topics for which you have new hypotheses that need to be tested, rather than stopping doing them altogether. I suppose what I'm saying is that we are not sure we have confidence that other people are going to go on with their before replicates. But should we be saying you should get to policy or look at government, you should be doing this intervention because we've done an RCT. But if we can't say that because the evidence is not strong enough, but other people aren't going to do the RCT, then should we have done it in the first place? <laughs> so I, I, I think it's, it's too soon for that note of despair in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the final comment. What we're finding from our places is huge hunger for that, exactly that sort of evidence. So, you know... Let's uh, do the RCTs as well. Yes, uh, to en and, and, and to be engaged in the process of, of testing hypotheses and, and providing match funding and so on, yes. Um, but, you know, I, I don't, we should talk about the specifics of your example, because what I'm hearing is there's some very interesting experimentation going on at NSPCC, and a lot of interest in what is coming out of that. So uh, I hope you won't give up. <laughs> yeah, okay, as ever, more research is needed. Um, so that brings us to the end of our time. Uh, I hope you'll join us downstairs for a, uh, a drink and a further chat. Uh, before we do that, I'd like to uh, thank once again our two speakers for keeping to time, but more importantly for uh, giving us two really interesting, stimulating uh, talks. Thanks very much. Thank you.